beloved friends, as we gather to pay tribute to the memory of two of the most remarkable young people of our generation, Harav uh, Eitam and Harabanit Naama Henkin, Zeche Tzadik Vitzadeket Livracha, there will be much grief expressed and very many tears shed. And not just this evening, but for as long as we remember this tragic and appalling incident. Our prayers and our, our embrace go to their respective families, their parents, their beloved children. This is an episode, an incident of which we know that even Moshe Rabbeinu in heaven is saying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu Zu Torah V'Zu Sechorah. We know this is the one thing that Moshe Rabbeinu asked HaKadosh Baruch Hu Mipnei Ma Yesh Tzadik V'Ralo that Hashem didn't answer him and refused to answer him. And so we are left with the questions and the grief and the tears. But there is, of course, an added dimension to our grief beyond the simple human one. And let me express my own personal connection here. You see, the Henkin family has been one of the greatest families of B'nai Torah of our time. I learned Torah, I'm the Talmud of Reb Nachum Rabinovich. And always, during all the years I learned with him, he held as his model the great Rav Henkin Zitzel, from whom he not only learnt substantively, but he learnt his whole mindset, his whole way of thinking about Gemara, about Halacha, about Psak Halacha. And of course, in our generation, Etam's parents, Rav Yehuda and Rav Yitzhak Chana Henkin, are among the supreme Torah teachers of our time by whom I personally have been constantly inspired. It was, I think, the late physicist Niels Bohr who once pointed out that had we not had a Newton to discover the laws of motion, some other scientist would one day have discovered those laws. But had we lost Shakespeare before he wrote King Lear, we would never have had another King Lear. Had Beethoven died before he wrote his late quartets, or Monet not lived to that old age in which he painted his water lilies, we would have lost something that we can never recover. Some of the supreme expressions of the human spirit become lost at moments like this. And what made her of Eitam so remarkable is that he was one of the prodigies of our time. I mean, he was a Torah scholar of the very, very highest kind, the kind that don't come often in any generation. He had depth and he had breadth. He had chen and sechel tov. He had Torah and he had chokhmah. Everything about him tells us that we have lost so many insights into Torah that only he could have given us. And in that sense, there is a grief that is almost irreparable. And there is really and truly only one answer I can give following the wise understanding of Rav Soloveitchik's Zetzal that when faced with tragedy, we can never ask the question answer the question, why did this happen? We can only ask and answer the question, what then shall I do? The Gemara tells us that in the grief surrounding the death of Moshe Rabbeinu, 3,000 halachas of Torah Shabal Peh were forgotten. They were lost. The people came to Yeshua and they said, ask in heaven to be given back those halachas. And the Gemara says, Yeshua replied, They came in the days of Shmuel and said, Shmuel, ask in heaven. 
And he replied, Ela Hamatzvot, the Ein Navira Shai, the Chadesh Bodava. You can't do these things by going up to heaven and asking heaven to give us back what we have lost. What we have to do, what we learn from Yosha and what we learn from Shmuel, is that we have to use our best endeavors despite the fact that they are so finite and frail and fallible. To be inspired by the memory of this extraordinary couple, by our sense of that terror that was lost. And we have to say, we will each commit ourselves to learn a little more, to think a little deeper, to teach a little more creatively. So that together, each one of us writes one letter in the Sefer Torah that was lost when they lost and when we lost this wonderful young couple. The juxtaposition of this terrible tragedy and Sukkot Zaman Simchatenu is a discord that jars and jangles in the mind. And yet even this has a message for us. We know that the second human child was called Hevel. And he was killed, just having done a great mitzvah. And it was that unexplained tragedy that haunted Shlomo HaMelech. In the words that he wrote in Kohelet, he kept saying them more than 30, nearly 40 times. He kept invoking this name, Hevel, Havel, Havalim, Hakol, Havel. And the essence of Kohelet, at least in its opening chapters, is how can anything be meaningful in a world in which a child can die having done a mitzvah, in which the human being is so vulnerable, we are havel, havalim, hakol, havel, a mere fleeting breath. It threatens to render every single ideal that we stand for meaningless, to know that we are so vulnerable. And yet in the end, of course, it is that hevel, that human breath, the breath of God within each one of us, vayipach ba'apav nishmat chayim, that blows the shofar in our cry to God. It is that hevel that gives us the voice to confess our sins and commit ourselves to a better future on Yom Kippur. It is that Hevel, symbolized by the sukkah, the dirat arai, the fragile dwelling that can be overturned, blown over by a sudden gust of wind. And yet we sit within that dirat arai, the symbol of human mortality, and somehow learn to listen to the voice of God and hearing it at our commentary, at our letter to the scroll that this young Rav and Rabbanit were destined to write and which we lost in losing them. Let each of us write a letter in that scroll. Let each of us dedicate it to their memory. And let each of us remember this fundamental truth that when a king dies, his power ends, but when a prophet or a great teacher dies, their influence remains. Something of what they inspired lives on in us. Let us take that and use it to write and teach a little of the terror that we lost in losing them. And may all those who knew them, their parents, their children, their many, many Talmidim v'talmidot, find comfort in being inspired by their memory to become a little greater because of them. Yehi zikram baruch.